Thank yes. Sorry, Thanks, Pro. <laughs> Say again. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Item is consideration of minutes from the Finance Committee meeting held on December 1st, 2014. Are there any corrections or editing necessary? I would entertain the motion to approve the minutes then. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> any opposed? Okay, minutes are approved. Uh, next item is a review of the core and elective service analysis for the fiscal year 2016 budget presented by <coughs> Elizabeth Holub, uh, Director of Finance. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, as part of the annual budget process, each year the operating departments update a document called the Core Elective Service Analysis. Um, the document begins in your packet on page five, and due to the substantive changes that were made last year, there were very few revisions offered for this, for this year for the committee's consideration. We've provided the document in redline format so you can clearly see the changes. There was a minor change offered to finance on the bottom of page seven. And then on, the, on page 11, uh, some changes to police to reflect the change in dispatch, uh, provision of dispatch <coughs> services. So those are the only two changes. Um, each of those uh, lists should have been reviewed with each council liaison by the department head. Um, so we would just open it up to any question or discussion by the committee. Any comments or thoughts about the analysis? <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, this was a matter of, for consideration, so uh, I guess we've considered it, and uh, we'll move <laughs> on to the next thing. <clears throat> uh, the next item is the capital budget, uh, also an informational item for uh, fiscal year 2016. Also presented by Elizabeth Holub. Thank you again, Chairman Paleon. Um, what we are doing this evening is we have a brief presentation and the packet material provided to you to update the work that staff has been doing on the capital budget since discussions by the Finance Committee on November 5th and December 1st. Um, the primary work that has been done relates to um, the, the scoring sheet, the CIP scoring sheet that's been the subject of discussion at the last two meetings, which has been revised um, to be more effective for the different operating departments. Uh, the new scoring sheet that has been utilized in the second round of scoring was in your packet on page 15. The specific changes related to uh, existing items number three and number six um, to uh, facilitate better scoring for those projects that have grant or an alternate funding secured pertaining to the project and then to also um, elaborate on the savings and efficiencies that can be achieved by a particular capital project. So the, the ratings were changed and there's an effort to quantify that saving or efficiency and to include that in the scoring sheet. Then we also added uh, item number nine uh, to give points to projects that are recurring capital improvement plan expenditures such as street resurfacing. Um, we did make a change in the second round of scoring so if Points are allocated for a project in any category. Comments are required to support the points scored for that particular item. So in December, uh, all projects in the capital improvement program for all five years were <coughs> rescored and resubmitted and re-reviewed at a staff level. And you can see the results of that rescoring in the detailed project listings in your packet. Uh, 
Um, in addition, um, staff uh, was committed to bringing back to you this month a five-year capital improvement program that was fully funded. We talked a little bit about the methodology using uh, the first year of the five years FY16 as an example in December. Uh, and once we got that metho methodology ironed out, we went back and looked at it for the full five-year period. So what you see on this slide uh, is a summary, and this is also on page 16 of your packet, of those pro projects that remain priority one in the capital improvement program by fund. And those are ones that do have funding available and were based on the new scoring uh, scored to meet a priority one level. Um, and you can see that, for example, the general fund, which is the, pri uh, the capital fund, which is our general capital improvements fund, the one where most projects are funded out of, uh, we had an average of 4.1 million available per year, and you can see that over the five-year period that's achieved, although in the out years that 4.1 has fluctuated up and down. Everything else on this page in <coughs> summary form is, um, does have funding available for the five years. The only one I did note is the golf course fund in FY17, which has a 255. There's a major uh, improvement to the parking lot in that. Um, and so once we get to the operating budget stage and work through the five-year forecast for the golf course fund, we'll determine whether or not that can stay as a priority one or move to a priority one not funded. Those individual projects are listed and identified on pages 17 to 20 in your packet. So you can review all of those items um, and then those again are, are recommended for funding in the five-year plan. The next page summarizes those projects that are not currently funded from available resources, and they're divided in different categories. The first is the priority one NF, which shows up in Planet as a priority four, and those are identified on page 21 in your packet. Um, most of those are in the capital fund, uh, and then we have a large major water plant project currently um, included in the water and sewer fund, which has been the subject of discussion by the Public Works Committee. So those individual projects did score a priority one under the new scoring, but currently do not have funding available for them. The next category uh, is identified on pages 22 and 23 in the packet. These are priority two projects. Also, no funding available, however, they scored a priority two, so they did score less on, this, on the scoring sheet than those that are priority one not funded. Uh, similarly, we have priority three projects that are identified on page 24 in your packet. We did create a new category, uh, which is new to our discussion from December. That's a priority five. These are grant-dependent projects. Those are identified on page 25, uh, and the reason for that is that those have typically been understood. Um, we've been applying for grant funding for these projects, and so we wanted to separately identify those as grant dependencies, which currently don't have grants awarded, but uh, grant funding is being pursued. There is... Um, ample time scheduled for the March 9th budget workshop to go into this in more detail. Um, we basically wanted to put the format in front of you, get you the material so that you have plenty of time to review this between now and March 9th. Uh, if you have any immediate questions, I can certainly address those. Um, or you can just absorb all that paper and detail between now and the next budget workshop of March 9th. Thank you. Are there any Questions, comments, observations? I, for my part, I would say it's like a great idea to pull out the grant-dependent projects because they're big and they were a consistent source of sort of moving the numbers around quite a bit. And uh, we ended up talking about them over and over again. And this way, at least they're identified and it's clear and they're kind of pulled out of the, the main body. So I think that's a good, good move. Okay, um, so I guess we've considered that for now, and uh, uh, the next item is other business, which really is uh, uh, any observations about the flash report or other 
finance related matters that anybody would like to speak about? Okay, there being none, uh, the next item is the opportunity for the public to address the Finance Committee. Any member of the public that would like to speak to the Finance Committee? Uh, in that case, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Unless there's, or is there something we could discuss from the City Council agenda that might be productive? Well, I hope so, because Biddy's going to be real nervous. I think she told people to be here at 7.30. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we'll be happy to uh, answer. Well, you know, maybe I could uh, do my two items that are at the end of the agenda. We can take care of those very quickly if that works for, for the council. Okay. Um, and while Biddy is not here, uh, I'll the uh, second to last item on the regular council agenda had to be uh, had to do with second reading of the codification of the city code and the ordinances. I know we had a lot of conversation at the last meeting, but what um, I was going to mention this evening is that um, after tonight, if the council approves second reading and the code is adopted, it will be online, it will be available uh, for both the council staff and the public to look at. But one of the things that we identified in going through the process is that there were some sections of the code that were really just outdated and needed to be updated. So um, what the staff is going to do is working with Biddy, now that we have a word version of that document, is to take their previous comments that they had and do an overstrike and an underscore with cha proposed changes to that. Biddy and I then will review that uh, we will then sit down with respected aldermen, and uh, I'm holding off on telling you exactly what your responsibility is because I need to get a sense as to how many sections and pages we're looking at. But what we will try and do is, uh, I know each of you are liaisons to a certain uh, functional department, and we will try to the best uh, of our ability to, to make sure that you're aligned with where your liaison responsibilities are. But there may be some sections, and I'll just say ComDev, which may be so large that Alderman Reisenberg doesn't want to get stuck with 600 pages, so we may then solicit another alderman to, to assist. Um, once the staff and the um, aldermen are able to then go through those sections and sort of decide, yeah, we like this or we don't like that, then what we'll do is forward it on to the city attorney and let them put it in an ordinance form that then we can put it on the agenda. There is no timetable per se that something has to get done right away. So I think this could take three, six months and we'll bring them back in more manageable bite sizes for the council uh, as, as we go forward. But the goal is by the end of 2015 that we've really gone through, we've scrubbed the ordinances and it's up to date with the exception of any ordinances that may get passed in the uh, final quarter of uh, 2015 by the city council. But I think at that point in time, we'll all feel very good about where we're at, and, uh, and we can go from there. Does that sound, mm -hmm. sound reasonable? So stay tuned. We'll be back in touch with respect to what your responsibilities are. Um, Susan Banks, could you please put up the community goals? The, um, the city council knows that every year at this time, um, I present to the council sort of the goals that we have going forward, making sure that they're <coughs> consistent with the, goal, the council's goals. Um, and so let me run through them and then I'll be happy to answer any questions or take any additional goals that the council might have. The first up there is deliberate mindfulness. And I think you've heard me talk about this in the past, but it's certainly something that the staff is going to be focused on and I hope the council is focused on as well. Um, we have nine independent thinkers representing the city council, which is a good thing. And I think that sometimes governing bodies get caught up in noise, biases, uh, preconceived uh, comments and so forth that sometimes lead us to make decisions without all of the facts and all of the considerations. And I guess I'm speaking now to all nine of you saying do not prevent the fact that you may not have been on the council very long or the fact that this isn't your ward or whatever the case might be from not speaking up. I just ask you do it in a civil way <laughs> to your fellow aldermen. But I think that 
if you have certain experiences, if you have certain uh, emotional reactions to things, then it is incumbent upon you to speak those um, feeling, speak about those feelings, because others might be as well. And I think the staff is going to be focused on this throughout 2015 too, uh, because I think sometimes we don't present all the facts, and we want to make sure that we're looking at all the data, all the emotions, all the concerns that people have, so that at the end of the day, whether we're talking about you know redevelopment of Laurel Avenue or some other. Uh, item that's before the City Council that we really have thought uh, have been thoughtful in our review of whatever this petition is taken all considerations into account and then have made a recommendation or decision based on all of that information so I think that's something and this is my own pet peeve because I think particularly at the state national level they don't do this at all uh, which I think has led to a lot of problems and I think Part of this is that we're here to solve problems, and the best way to do that is to get all the data and the facts out on the table. So we're going to be really conscious of that. Uh, the second item, uh, and I know Prue heard me talk to the chamber about this, is manage disruption because 2015 is going to be an exciting year, but it is going to be filled with inconveniences and probably a lot of negative emotions and so forth. There is a lot of good things going on in the city of Lake Forest in 2015. And that is a good thing. Uh, but unfortunately, and, and I apologize, I don't have the map right here, but if you look at what's scheduled and what's just in the pipeline for 2015, literally there's not a area of town that's not going to be touched in one way, shape, or form. So I said at the chamber meeting, we don't discriminate. We inconvenience everybody equally. <laughs> um, but I think people need to know that going into the summer and, and so forth and just be patient. Um, I use the, uh, the analogy of Aaron Rodgers, just relax. Uh, I don't know if he's relaxed today after uh, that game the other night, but um, keep in mind that it's almost like when you renovate your kitchen. You know, it's very exciting when you first get into the project, and then it's a real pain in the rear end when you're in the middle of the project, but then at the end you're very happy that you did the project. And I think that's what you're going to see, whether it's Laurel Avenue, whether it's the hospital, or you know, 15 other projects that are going to be going on, whether there are city projects or a number of private projects are going to be on as well. Um, and, but as a part of that too, we have to remember that there is going to be a lot of negative emotions by residents. And at least from the staff perspective, we have to recognize that we are not going to take this personally. That when someone is upset because they were inconvenienced or they were supposed to have a wedding and you know, there's uh, construction vehicles parked out in front of their house, whatever the case might be, we're going to do the best that we can to work through those, but we recognize that there will be those situations and that we have to uh, not take it personally and be uh, willing to sort of bite our tongues and work with the residents as best we can to try and resolve those issues. Uh, the third item is uh, community asset appreciation and I think this was reinforced for me recently when we went to Gorton and we saw the work that was going on at Gorton. But really I think that, and I know that I'm probably one of the worst at this, is that the longer you're in town, the less appreciation you have for all the wonderful things you have in town. You take things for granted. And one of the things that working with Susan Banks and some other people work in Open Lands and some other groups like that that we're going to try and do is really try and promote these assets that are within our community and ask residents to reconnect. You know, to go walk the middle fork or, you know, do this, do that, because it's almost like we just take them for granted and we drive by them and we don't really appreciate them. But there's a lot of really wonderful things that are out there right now, a lot of wonderful things that are going to be coming about in 2015. But I think one of the ways maybe we can distract residents from all the disruption is have them focus on all the wonderful assets that are out there as well. And then the final, and this will always be on, uh, our community goals is the financial acumen and uh, you know we have high hopes with the new governor but who knows what's going to happen there but at least uh, uh, Elizabeth and I have chatted and we don't see any major change on the horizon in terms of the financial situation in the state of Illinois I think it's actually going to get uh, worse before it gets better and I think we have to be prepared for that and we just sort of work through that so this will be one that uh, is going to be constantly at the forefront. Susan, can you uh, put up the next? And then the priority goals, and uh, 
Most of these are, I, I think, uh, similar to last year's. Uh, with the hospital in, in full swing, the hospital expansion is going to be a major project for us in many ways. Uh, and part of that is just the impact that they're going to have. I mean, when you consider how many people are going to be coming to work there every day to build this new facility and, and some of the other things, it's going to be disruptive and, and we're just going to have to work through it to the best of our ability. And I will say it's going to be a challenge for us at a staff level because it isn't every day that you have to supervise or in, um, get uh, involved with a $400 million uh, health facility construction project like this is going to be. Uh, the other is the redevelopment of Laurel Avenue site. Uh, that's a priority. Things are, are moving. Uh, I'm sure the focus development probably wishes they were moving faster. Uh, and we will move them as quickly as we possibly can, but we also want to make sure that, you know, the community, uh, there's a certain pace to decisions being made within the community as well, and I think we have to be sensitive to how that impacts the surrounding properties. And, uh, and finally, and uh, we started this last year, and I think this goes to a lot of those items that are on your capital improvement uh, report that you just saw, some of the other things that will be going on in 2015. But really, I think we always look to all of these improvements is are they creating value for our community? Are they enhancing who we are as a community? Are they enhancing uh, us being a place to be rather than just a place to visit uh, or a place to work? We want this really to be a destination that people want to live. Uh, they want to work. They want to raise their families and so forth. And so most uh, of the projects that we have an eye to is how are we creating that kind of uh, sense of place to be? Um, because we think long term that's what's going to make or continue to uh, keep Lake Forest as a special place. Uh, I have colleagues that remind me from time to time that there's an awful lot of communities out there that were special about 50 years ago that aren't so special today. And I think our challenge is to make sure that we don't do anything that causes that kind of change 25 or 50 years from now, even if people sometimes who live here today don't understand why we're making the decisions that we do. Really, we are looking for the long term and not necessarily for short term uh, turnaround or short term investment. So those are the uh, priority goals uh, as we've identified. Be happy to take any questions or if there's something that's not on the list. Uh, as you know, we've got a thousand other things that we're doing on a day to day basis, but these are the ones that we want to make sure that we keep our eye on the ball and we keep focused that these are very important for us at the staff level and with the city council to make sure uh, occur in all of our actions. Thank you. Observations? Okay. Did I talk long enough to drag things out? <laughs> no. no. You could have gone longer. <laughs> we needed another topic. <laughs> all right, well, let me see. Uh, oh, boy. You really went through the finance committee stuff real fast. Mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, Bob, are are, uh, are the Lake Forest Lake Bluff Park guys here? I think I saw Chris. I don't know if I was Ty's just here looking for Ty. I don't know if Ty is. I don't, I don't see him. Chris was out in the lobby. I did see him. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, we don't have that. I don't know if Kathy, if you want to say anything about the uh, TIF district, if there's any updates. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman Pandelan, members of the council. On your agenda later tonight is um, a recommendation from the Plan Commission. This came before you at your last meeting. Uh, at your last meeting, you granted first reading of three ordinances related to the creation of the TIF district for the Laurel and Western Avenue properties. Uh, those three ordinances are before you later tonight for final approval. Those ordinances, the first one approves the redevelopment plan. Um, importantly, uh, this redevelopment plan is based on the development parameters that the plan commission previously recommended and the city council accepted. This plan does not approve a specific plan. The focus development plan still needs to go through plan commission public hearings. Uh, we are actually waiting for focus to submit uh, revised plans 
uh, to get us their technical information. We have not yet received preliminary engineering, their traffic study, so they are working on all their due diligence right now. Uh, second ordinance designates the redevelopment project area, which is the approximately 10 acre site on the northwest corner of Laurel and Western Avenues. And the third ordinance adopts the tax increment allocation financing for the project area. All three of those ordinances are required uh, to establish the TIF district by granting final approval tonight. You do not authorize any spending. You simply put the tool of the TIF district in place um, so that uh, we can proceed with cleanup of the site, addressing uncompacted soil, demolition of the buildings. So that, again, that will be before you later on your regular council agenda. I would be happy to answer any questions. Kathy, could you give the council an update on uh, kind of the status of that process, the, the demolition bids, the request for qualifications on a owner's rep, some, some of the things we've discussed? Sure. Um, this week we're actually expecting responses to a request for qualifications proposals that was sent out for an owner's rep. Um, we would look to bring you a recommendation to bring in an owner's rep to oversee the cleanup of the property. Uh, we really don't have that expertise on staff. In the past, we've worked with Midwest Environmental. They have completed the phase one, the limited phase two. Midwest Environmental, uh, just before Christmas, did some further asbestos sampling on the existing administration building. Uh, so that we're not losing time, they're actually um, working to get the remaining asbestos issues addressed um, concurrently while we're waiting for bids for an owner's rep. Once we bring an owner's rep in, then we would expect that person to really oversee and make recommendations to the council um, on hiring appropriate contractors, setting a timeline, and trying to expedite uh, the demolition, which can occur after the uh, asbestos is remediated and after the salt is gone <laughs> um, and then that ever occur salt being gone yeah mm -hmm. i think it's snowing right now uh, just um, just checking um and the uh owner's rep would be responsible for also coordinating with focus so that we're aligning the work on the site uh we do know that focus proposes a significant amount of underground parking uh, we don't want to be in the position of removing soils, bringing in clean soil, compacting it, and then having them come right behind us and remove that soil. So we'll really be working closely with the owner's rep. I would expect that that owner's rep would report regularly to the Property and Public Lands Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman yeah. Adelman. Just a comment for... Uh, my fellow aldermen, a lot of you know I bring some good ideas here from my coffee clutch at McDonald's <laughs> uh, 7 o'clock in the morning across from Sunset Foods. And I was stunned when the, some of the fellows the other day accosted me being misinformed that they were all going to start getting taxed because of this tax increment finance, financing district. And I had to explain to them the dynamics of how a TIF works. And I think I did a pretty good job, not having understood it initially myself and really honed in on it. And it's going to be incumbent upon all of us, really, to understand how it works and how to give a simple e explanation. Because if my coffee guys were thinking this, and they're a bunch of smart fellas and women, uh, I can see where it's going to come up over and over where a lot of the residents think, oh, we've created a TIF and now their taxes are going up to pay for the TIF, which is absolutely not the case. So I think we need to um, be prepared to deal with that. It's a good point. Thank you. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. lots, of, lots of misunderstandings and unfortunate uh, inappropriate use of the tool around this part of the country in the past. and. We've had one very, very, very successful use of the TIF, and we're planning to do it again. But uh, it's uh, it's it's, an, uh, it's it's sort of a lightning rod concept around around particularly around Chicago. So uh, it's a good point. And if anybody has any lingering questions about how it actually works, um, 
I, I agree with Alderman Edelman. We, we've got to get educated so that we can explain this clearly and simply to people that generally aren't going to understand it as we didn't understand it before we got in the middle of it. And maybe a three-minute video on the website, a primer in TIFFS 101 that residents can click on and watch. I mean, we've got some materials from some of the presentations that could go into a mm -hmm. little summary. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a great idea. I, I think one aspect that um, would help many of us, myself included, is to understand the timing of flows, both in and out, uh, from the city's perspective, obviously. Um, that That's something that I'm, I'm yet calibrating on. I, I don't have all the answers for myself. I think Elizabeth would love to do a video. <laughs> <laughs> With music and dancing. Yeah, right. <laughs> dancing numbers. If uh, it's the pleasure of the Finance Committee slash City Council, I know that uh, Ty and Chris are now here. Okay. If you'd like to hear the presentation on the Joint Task Force report. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Just for the benefit of the Council, you may recall that the Mayor and Board of Commissioners for the Lake Bluff Park District appointed a joint committee and the council's representative was Alderman Edelman and they met over the course of 2014 and uh, met a number of times to look at synergies between the City of Lake Forest Park and Recreation Department and the Lake Bluff uh, Park District to see if there was ways that both of us could save money and do things more efficiently. So um, while they are uh, getting that up and running, I don't know, Mike, if you want to uh, say anything or steal their thunder or wait until they go and add any color no i was just a worker bee chris and oh. and ty did the heavy lifting <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i've heard that said about him before yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't just the coffee clutch guys you know? <laughs> well that's where do you think i got all those ideas yeah. <clears throat> i didn't have anything to do How's this work? <coughs> okay. Well, now we got all that figured out. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm Ty Magnuson, and this is Chris Mossbarger. Chris Mossbarger, thanks for having us. And uh, we ended up being the respective Lake Forest, Lake Bluff co chairs of this Park and Rec uh, Joint Task Force. Uh, just very quickly, it came together about a year and a half ago. Uh, we volunteered like uh, the other six of us, and it was uh, based on uh, four members uh, from each community. And it was really at the mayor's and uh, Kevin Considine's Lake, Lake Bluff Park District uh, that uh, set things off. And then uh, Bob uh, connected with Ron Salsky from the park district as well. Um, so, um, you can see there uh, Mike's part of it from uh, Lake Forest as well as Dan Jaska and uh, Peter Schaefer and then we had Brock Gordon, Al Tress and Nikki Walsh from um, Lake Bluff and then we were helped uh, tremendously on both sides staffs uh, Ed Heiser in Lake Bluff and Sally here in uh, Lake Forest. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the question out is wh why did we have this task force? And it re really, I think, uh, initially was uh, simply of uh, getting the groups together and having some discussion. Uh, the commission itself was rather broad. We didn't have it specifically outlined. Um, and with that, we sort of uh, took off uh, in a variety of ways when we started uh, meeting at first. and. Uh, I think uh, it was a bit of a shotgun approach, I think, that we took, uh, and we were sort of spinning our wheels to be truthful about it. And we started diving into the numbers, and that was difficult because not, the dump numbers didn't line up exactly between the respective uh, organizations. So um, what we did was we took a step back and said, okay, what are the focal points? Uh, and what we came up with is the programs, the rec programs themselves, the aquatic facility in Lake Bluff, the respective beaches, and the respective golf courses. 
And so those were the four areas that we focused on. And uh, we'll talk about those more specifically in a moment. But with that, the takeaways were uh, that we found that both operations were operating pretty leanly. Uh, we felt that there was a greater opportunity for reciprocity and more transparency of operations between the two. And also, what we wanted to do is engender more collaboration between the two groups. Um, in essence, I think I just sort of uh, stated all that. We didn't find any, nor were we looking for necessarily, uh, any real big dollar savings. Uh, we, th you know, both sides are pretty pared down at this point. Uh, <clears throat> and what we're looking for was how can we share the programs more? And that's basically uh, what we went after in our, in our work in the respective areas. Uh, I do want to comment uh, first uh, on the golf course. Uh, to us, our takeaway, and we'll get into it further, is that there needs to be more uh, observation, more discussion, and more far-reaching look-aheads on the golf course that, that we didn't have the time or the resources to get into that. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but we all know that um, golf course rounds are down a bit or flat to down. Uh, the industry itself is, is not in an upward mode. It's in a flat to downward mode. Uh, we have <coughs> two golf courses that principally lie on flood plains. <coughs> uh, the Deer Path Golf Course, I think a lot of you probably know, uh, reverts to the Dick family if it's not uh, a a golf course or a recreational facility, if I think if I had that right. So um, <clears throat> there's more to be done in that area, and we'll, we'll get into that further. Um, from a capital point of view, we looked in the respective areas of the ability to share equipment, and we didn't find a whole lot there. There are some opportunities, uh, but for the most part, the actual equipment sharing is difficult when you have a need to use, say, the lawnmower is at the golf course. At Deer Path, you have to do it simultaneously at Lake Bluff. So it's not like you can throw them back and forth. Um, however, there are opportunities uh, between the two groups in uh, possibly uh, synergies with some of the capital needs such as roofing and, and other big ticket items and going out to bid at the same time on common items. <coughs> So I'll jump in and give Ty a, a little break here. Uh, Ty and I actually worked on this subcommittee and um, got a lot of help from Sally on, on much of the data in here. On the first bullet point, um, you know, using the, the theme of reciprocity, we looked first at, at just getting rid of non-resident fees in both communities, Lake Forest using Lake Bluff programs and vice versa, and what the impact of that might be. And I think we were both pleasantly surprised to find out that the impact was pretty nominal. Um, $20,000 total between the two communities. Um, and I think you'll hear later tonight, and I know in Lake Bluff, I believe in February, Sally and I were talking about, um, there's gonna be a board recommendation to eliminate the non-resident fee for Lake Forest folks using Lake Bluff uh, Park District programs. So we think that's a nice step going forward. Um, we did take a look at all of the program offerings in the two communities, and, and while there are a ton of similarities, um, there were a few things that stood out that, that I thought were interesting as a Lake Bluffer. Um, you know, I was certainly aware of the Discovery, Wildlife Discovery Center and aware of the squash and racquetball courts. I did not know anything about Sterling, uh, the Creative Arts Center, which is a phenomenal facility. Um, and didn't know that you could rent cross-country skis out at Heller Nature Center. Um, fantastic. In Lake Bluff, many of you might not know uh, that we offer CPR classes and babysitter certification, as well as dog obedience training. Um, this highlighted for both of us that maybe there's a marketing opportunity here in both communities, and if we can pick up on the revenue side, some of the 20 grand that we might be losing, um, you don't need to, to have many more folks sign up for classes to make up the $20,000. So 
from a marketing standpoint, um, you know, we talked a lot about the brochures and the mailing of all these brochures and how much that costs. Could you go down to one brochure for the two communities? If you put them side by side, they look very similar. Um, maybe there's some way to combine it, and we kicked around ideas. Um, we learned there, uh, there might be a, a significant mailing cost increase by putting them together. Um, but we, we encouraged both Ed and Sally to kind of look at ways that we might be able to do that. Um, I did skip that, the super pass concept uh, that'll go back to. Uh, selfishly, I brought this one up to the group, and, and I'm sorry to hear that no one has bought one of these yet, but um, the idea, uh, I take my son down to um, basketball in Lake Forest every week for practices on Wednesday nights. Um, it would be great to be able to drop him at Deer Path, go to the fitness center, um, go back and pick him up, because I really don't have time to get back to the one in Lake Bluff and come back down again. Um, I know that, that the two uh, communities have come together. There's a, I think a 10 punch for $60, Sally? For $60. Um, very cheap, enables the Lake Bluff member to use the Lake Forest facility and vice versa. Hasn't taken off yet, but I think is, uh, is that's marketed a little bit more in both communities, it probably will. Um, the last point, um, I mentioned that we do have a lot of programs that are similar. Um, a few years back, we combined the basketball programs, I believe, to the benefit of both communities. There probably are some other programs we could look at combining. Dance is one that, that Ty and I looked at. Um, Lake Forest has a very strong program. Lake Bluff, not quite as much. A lot of the Lake, Lake Bluff folks go to private instruction. It'd be great if we could capture that somehow in the Park District program. So something to uh, explore a little bit more. Um, on the aquatic facility uh, side of things, and that's the uh, Lake Bluff pool, uh, it, there's only one. Um, and the question is, is how best uh, can the two communities share uh, one facility? As we know, uh, there's been uh, several uh, referendums go up over the years uh, for putting a pool here in Lake Forest, and I believe they have gone down to the feet, something like 51 to 49. Um, but the, at the end of the day, uh, there's one pool, and it costs a lot to maintain that pool, as well as it costs a lot to build a pool. Um, so uh, what we were trying to do is really get better data on the use between the two communities. And actually, we had a hard time finding that out because we simply weren't recording data of usage of Lake Forest people at Lake Bluff Pool. Uh, at best we could tell, there might be a loss of $12,000 in revenue at the Lake Bluff pool should they go without uh, non-resident fees. <clears throat> With that, we said, okay, we better have to do a better job of, uh, you know, <coughs> getting our data, and I believe that was tabulated over the course of the last summer, and they're looking at it uh, at this point in time. Also. In November, Lake Bluff Park District passed their referendum, and with that, uh, they will now have monies uh, coming from that, which will allow for the deferred maintenance on that facility, uh, fixing up the former uh, <coughs> baby pool that was not a baby pool and, and other areas of, of that. <clears throat> Our takeaway is, is let's look further for more reciprocity, how we can better <coughs> use it, uh, with the Lake Forest people in mind, uh, tying in with uh, some of the uh, programs more, uh, but try to make the most of, of the single uh, pool asset that we have between the two communities. Uh, we uh, encourage the possibility, since there's only one pool for the two communities, uh, that possibly uh, uh, Lake Forest might uh, consider uh, sharing in some of the cost uh, as it is used by both communities. But that needs uh, further <laughs> review and discussion, uh, but it's something that we think is, is worthwhile. The beach, beaches. Um, 
The first bullet point, I think that's already started, right, Sally? The cross-training of the lifeguards? In March, it will start. So um, we thought that was an obvious one. So uh, both uh, of the staffs agreed, and, and they went ahead and started that. Every time we started talking about beach and reciprocity, the, the issue of parking kept coming up. Um, and that is a real problem. We understand that. But um, Lake Forest right now offers um, Lake Bluff folks the ability to use the beach during the week uh, without paying any fee. Um, there is no reciprocity. Lake Bluff currently charges a Lake Forest resident to use the beach. Um, we would like to see that go away. Lake Bluff wanted to take the summer of 2014 to track usage to determine how many folks they're talking about. I don't think it was very many. Um, so we're hopeful that in 2015, something could be done on the reciprocity side there. Um, <coughs> the fourth bullet point, we also talked about um, reciprocity. If one beach is closed for some reason, whatever that might be, those folks could go use the beach in the other community. Um, capital equipment's tough because a lot of those uh, uh, machines are tough to move from one beach to another, but if there's any opportunity to share cost on the capital side, uh, that certainly should be explored. Okay, our, our final item uh, or area is in the area of golf. And uh, this was, uh, <coughs> one that we sort of had a hard time initially getting our hands on, but then we decided, well, there's really a short-term, mid-term, and long-term view here. And the short-term really centers on getting more usage of the two golf courses between the two communities. And basically, it was eliminating non-resident fee, proposing putting forth a, a 10 punch pass concept to engender greater use amongst those here in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff in the respective Deer Path Lake Bluff uh, golf courses. Um, where we're at right now on it is, is that um, there is now an elimination or between the members, uh, each member can go to their <laughs> other <laughs> uh, course. Uh, Deer Pathers can go to Lake Bluff and vice versa uh, at uh, a $25 uh, per round including cart fee. Uh, which is not, was not the case before. Now, this is just for those who are members uh, when they sign up for the full uh, summer membership. Uh, going forward, uh, <clears throat> the 10 punch pass concept has been uh, nixed just because it's administratively difficult, uh, but we're looking at um, putting forth a proposal, I think in February, uh, <clears throat> is to eliminate uh, the non-resident fees between the two communities. At the end of the day, we want more usage of the golf courses <coughs> from those here in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff. Um, then <coughs> we are recommending or did recommend uh, in terms of midterm and longer term, uh, creating an advisory committee uh, to between the two communities on the golf courses <coughs> to look uh, beyond just the immediate and, and what is really the longer term nature. How do we operate these courses? Is there a better way to work together, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, at this point in time, uh, I'd say the wheels are in motion for that. Uh, there's been discussions. I, I, Bob, you've <coughs> been meeting with uh, Ron Salsky from uh, Lake Bluff Park District, and things are, are underway. Uh, one of the things here is that uh, Deer Path's a little bit further ahead in the, uh, in the cycle of how to operate in terms of a third party operator than Lake Bluff. And some of these things have to be worked out and, and some of these things will take some time to be worked through. But uh, basic point is, is that the discussions have been had uh, to move forward in this way and uh, we believe it's taken place. Um, some synergies have been or looked at in terms of uh, utilizing um, common equipment and one thing that they're going to go forward with is uh, a joint sharing of, of the golf courts uh, when there is a big event at either uh, <coughs> course. Uh, sometimes they run short of, of golf carts, and so they're going to ferry them back and forth rather than go to outside rental. So that's a, another example of how 
the communities can work better together uh, at, amongst the parks and district folks uh, to uh, lo hopefully lower the costs uh, and, and just create a, a greater sense of uh, community between the two courses, et cetera. Um, so uh, from an overall point of view, uh, <clears throat> what things we strive for were, you know, more openness, more reciprocity, more transparency of the operations. And <coughs> over the course of the year plus, and, and really since we sort of uh, uh, ceased our, our task force, which was la at the end of last summer, there, we've seen all that happen. And I think that's really the big gain uh, here, and we expect it, plan on it, to continue uh, to see if uh, <coughs> we can operate these uh, respective uh, park districts uh, more efficiently and to the betterment and greater use uh, of the residents in both Lake Forest and Lake Bluff. Um, we have a comment here about, you know, <coughs> maybe there's further cost savings out there, but I think it really needs to be done in the context of, of how much is Lake Forest and Lake Bluff going to get together for common operations, common personnel, and those types of things, uh, <clears throat> which we did not dive into, but we think there's a possibility there. So uh, net net, uh, we're happy with where things have come out at this point. Uh, we believe uh, we're a step ahead of things. Uh, uh, from when we started, and we hope it to continue. So uh, we'd be happy to take on any questions from anybody. Thank you, and, and first and foremost, thank you for the effort and all the hard work that went on. It's, it's a pretty comprehensive overview, it looks like. So um, questions or comments or observations? Alderman Adelman. First of all, I'd like to say how much I enjoyed serving on the task force. Um, I enjoyed meeting the folks from Lake Bluff and learning more about your facilities. I enjoyed the people from Lake Forest that I worked with and our own park and rec uh, people. It was an eye-opener for me. Um, two areas I'd like to comment on, uh, the golf course. There's two issues there. I mean, we're trying to save money by looking at synergies, so to minimize expenses. But on the revenue side, We'd like to enhance revenues, and that's like a two-prong uh, component. There's retainage of existing customers, and then there's capturing new customers. And the thought of having reciprocity, reciprocity between the two golf courses goes towards retaining the customer base. If there's an outing at Lake Forest, such that uh, the course is jammed up. If with the reciprocity and, and greens fees between the two courses, then you, a Lake Forest member can go over to Lake Bluff and play that day and vice versa. So the hope is that if a Lake Bluff golfer or a Lake Forest golfer, for one reason or another, can't get on their own golf course, that we keep them at either one of the two courses, not go out to Pine Meadow or down to Highland Park. So that's... Mike, you, many people might not know, but Lake Bluff Golf Course had the reciprocity, of course, not with Deer Path, but with Deerfield Golf right. Course. And so they were running off to Deerfield rather than now uh, we have them set up to go to Deer Path. Right. So that's the retainage. Capturing new... Uh, golfers from outside either one of our two communities is also a goal because there's people who come to uh, Deer Path to golf from outside of Lake Bluff Lake Forest. They come from the south, they come from Highland Park, they come from Deerfield, uh, maybe Mundelein, so forth. And if we could <coughs> offer some sort of a device or mechanism where they could pick and choose from Lake Bluff one day, Lake Forest the other day, it's like they're getting a membership, a non-resident membership in two golf courses instead of one. So that might help attract uh, more users and add to the revenue side of the equation. Uh, so those were my, some of the thoughts that came out of the golf course subcommittee. The aquatic facility, and now everybody's going to jump all over me. The, one of the brainstorms that I had, and <laughs> this didn't go to looking for synergies, is I came up with an idea, unfortunately, that would cost millions of dollars. 
But personally, <laughs> I'm just not into swimming pools in our climate. They've got a two to three month season. Then the winter wreaks havoc on the plumbing. When I looked at Lake Bluff's facility, it shows the wear and tear from our climate. And I got this idea from a wedding I attended three years ago out in Wyoming, about an hour south of Jackson Hole. I stayed in the town of Pinedale, population 2,000, plus surrounding rancher residents. And Pinedale, with its 2,000 residents, has a 12-month year indoor enclosed aquatic facility. It's almost like a water park that the park district of Pinedale runs. Now, if a town of 2,000 people can afford this beautiful indoor aquatic facility that parents were coming to with their kids of all ages, teenagers and so forth, um, the thought occurred to me that maybe Lake Bluff and Lake Forest could pool their resources and convert Lake Bluff's aquatic facility to a 12-month out-of-the-year water park. But that costs money, and we're in belt-tightening mode, I mean, we're not salting the roads as much as we did in the past to save a few dollars here. And uh, we're not redoing medians on major thoroughfares because it costs a lot of money. But if there's anybody out there who likes the concept and wants to make a donation, we'll open the fund. <laughs> <laughs> I, thank, thank you. I have, I have a question. I, I know uh, uh, Deer Path is managed by Kemper. What's the management structure at, uh, at Lake Bluff? No Kemper. It's no third party. It's no self-managed within the park district. Uh-huh. Yeah. It does seem to me that having a common management structure would drive a lot of synergies. Just having the same pair of eyes look at the same operations. I'll just... I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that bomb has been dropped, but I, I if, if it hasn't, I, I felt I, I compelled would say to do it. A lot of folks on the uh, task force shared that opinion. Um, what we found early on, as as Ty mentioned earlier, Lake Forest is well ahead of Lake Bluff um, with that relationship with Kemper. Um, Lake Bluff just hasn't decided to go that way yet. I'll leave it at that. Um, but who knows? They, they may in the in the future, and and those synergies that you talk about certainly could be realized. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. I just want to take the opportunity, to Ty and Chris, and, and everyone on the committee. Thank you very much. I know it was a year and a half. Um, I roped you into this, and I appreciate you doing it. But I think it it truly it ties. You said I, I think the intent was not to find the big ticket item. Was, was certainly if we could find operational efficiencies, that was great but how we can better serve the residents. And that's what we're trying to do. And I think you've got a great jump start on a lot of that process. And I would give great kudos to you and your group and, and certainly Sally and Ed and, and Kevin as well for really kind of taking the ball on that. And I know I've asked you and I, I know you've agreed to continue to serve uh, and not disband this group. The last thing we want to do is take the product, put it on a shelf and not look at it again. So. I'm grateful for your continued involvement and certainly appreciate the time that you've given us and it's been very beneficial. Thanks. Welcome, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I would then entertain a motion to adjourn the Finance Committee so that we can start the City Council. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the meeting is adjourned, thank you. We will take a five minute recess. We will start the Council meeting at approximately 7.33.